poem. In the garden of destiny, where roses bloom, to hearts found solace, dispelling the gloom. In whispered vows beneath a star-kissed sky, love blossomed true and spirit soared high. From palaces grand to simpler shores, their journey of love forever endures. Hand in hand, through joy and strife, they crafted a world as husband and wife. Six years have passed, like rivers they flow, through valleys of hope and peaks of woe. Yet unwavering their love remains, a beacon of light through life's varied plains. For love is a journey, a timeless quest, a dance of souls forever blessed. In the eyes of the world, they stand as one, the Duke and Duchess, their hearts undone. So here's to the Duke and Duchess fair, a love story rare beyond compare. Through every challenge, through thick and thin, their journey shows that love always wins. Here is to the Duke and Duchess, Prince Harry and Princess Meghan. Congratulations. It hasn't been six easy years, but you're showing the world what love is all about. Happy anniversary. Hello everyone and welcome, bienvenue, bienvenidos. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to have you here and thank you for, you know, gifting us the most precious gift one has these days, which is time, right? Thank you for spending your time here with us. This is Majesty Sussex Report and I'm still Antonio, so <laughs> welcome. This is part two of I'm Not a Racist. And um, we will get into it pretty quick, quickly, because I don't want to um, prolong it for too long. And I'm trying, as I said before, to fit um, my podcast um, episodes into 45 minutes, 30 minutes or so. Okay. I wanted to say welcome uh, to all the new subscribers. I know the last two weeks or so, there's been... A, a, a real wonderful um, increase in subscribers and I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving this channel a chance for um, liking what you, well, I hope you did um, <laughs> because you subscribed. So uh, liking the content and, and all of that, I, I, I hope I continue to produce and create content that um, is useful at the same time entertaining whenever we can and also to bring um, topics and discussion to us um, that sometimes it's uncomfortable but I think sometimes it's necessary right for us to face certain things I appreciate each and every one of you I love doing this I I, I get joy out of it but sometimes I get very um, manic also because I want things to be a certain way. So I'm a little bit crazy that, that way. Um, and I always want to produce and bring to you the best of what I can at that time and in that moment. So there's certain standards I always want to fulfill. And I hope that you will continue to support the channel and 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 interact and give feedback and have an opinion on the content or the delivery of um, what's happening within the Sussex world. So thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you. I really, really, really appreciate it. I have an update for um, my wonderful people who listen to the episode um music playlist May 17th, where I talked about um, the baby pigeons on my terrace. 
Um, so I just love all of your comments and I'm happy that um, it brought some joy and made you laugh because it, it, it was meant, I think, um, hopefully for it to be a little bit funny and I'm happy that you folks did find it funny. So um, CK and, and, and Connie and Joyce and um, Janet and um, Arja, uh, Marsha, um, Ryzen, Phoenix, all of you, thank you so very much for your commentary and um, for, you know, enjoying that story. So, my mother, I think, thinks that these pigeons are my pet or something now. So she wanted to feed them on Friday. I was like, Mom, stop it. I'm like, you're not feeding the pigeons. They have a mother. She feeds them. And then on Saturday, she calls me and she's like, so um, did you make sure that the mother brought them food? I, I was like, Mom. <laughs> And she called me again today and said, how are the pigeons doing? It's like, mom, they're not my pet, okay? They're just taking up real estate on my terrace. <laughs> and they're really bad tenants because <laughs> they just create an, a lot of mess. If, if for you folks who don't know what, what I'm talking about, if you want to know um, the episode that's on... Um, um, music playlist uh, May 17th you can go there and um, you'll find out all about these pigeons that are on my terrace anyways the other thing I wanted to do is just to say also thank you to all of you who comment and 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 leave messages um, Connie Walmart thank you so much for the super thank um, thank you for all of you who uh, when you can leave uh, a, a, a super thank you, um, you know, these things help. They, they absolutely help in how um, I'm able to either buy a certain type of software or get something else or so on. So I absolutely ap ap appreciate it. We are a small channel. We, we, we um, are slowly growing. And everything that um, I've been able to do thus far, it's been um, out of what I, I I want this channel to be like, look like, and, 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 and all of that. So when you folks, you know, help and contribute, it's, it's, it's highly, highly appreciated. I, um, and I always feel odd saying things like that. It's just the weirdest thing. I'm not a good salesperson. Um, and to the members, thank you so much for being members um, and, um, you know, for supporting the channel the way you do. Connie, I know you said that um, you don't see the join button to join the membership. Um, it is actually, uh, you should be able to see it on the, on the, on the front page of the um where you press play and all that information is. Okay, you know what I'll do? I am going to stop talking right now and I'm gonna screenshot a couple of things and put it up so you're able to see it. And I'm not sure if you're watching um, on your phone or laptop or computer, um, but I'll try and put this, this stuff up so you'll know hopefully where the, the, the sign or the button is in order to join, okay? Um, that's it. That's, that's it folks. Um, once again, thank you to each and every one of you, um, for your commentary. I love it. I read all of it. I'm so sorry. I can't respond to all of it. Um, but I try when I can and, um, I'm going to do my best to bring back or, or be more consistent in bringing back, um, comments. So, you know, I can read your comments and, and we can have that kind of interaction. Okay. Let's get it on. Okay, so this first um, image here is uh, the channel homepage and the join button um, to become a member is right next to the subscribe button. So that's on the homepage. Um, and if you go into the description 
um, page that is on any of the podcasts, any of the episodes. Just go into the um, the the description, sorry, um, page, and you will see at the very sort of very bottom, you'll see um, YouTube membership, and you can click there also. And on the other one, this is if you're using your mobile, and you would have to click on one of the episodes. So search for and YouTube Majesty Sussex Report. Once you get there, click on one of the episodes. And once it's open to that episode, um, you should be able to see on the front page right there, it will say join, right? Where it also it has like um, where you can remix, um, notification, thumbs up or down. Um, no, no, no thumbs down, please. And um, super thanks or or that. So it's right in that area. Okay. Hope that works. If it doesn't, please let me know. Okay, so I um, will leave it up here. Um, also, in case you need some more time to read through it, I didn't read it out because I don't want to have the channel get into any problems or anything like that by, by voicing um, word by word what is there. But I wanted to start out here because I think it's important to understand that this sort of language, behavior, ideology goes to the very top and it goes to the very influential and people who make decisions also, right? They hold these ideas, they hold these opinions. And when we think it's just, you know, maybe a poorly educated person or something like that, no, it's, 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 it's not, right? And it is in many ways, scary but it's the it's it's good to know right it's good to know and to be and to be prepared so i think it's important to bring this to the discussion as crude as it is and as disturbing of a converse uh, of a conversation that this um ukip leader girlfriend um had you know what what it shows or, or it brings to light is some deeply ingrained prejudices so the goal right now around this is to um dissect these comments understand the broader implications of such racist attitudes and um and so you know this discuss ways we can we can work towards a, a, a more inclusive um, society, like like like, what what is the remedy? Um, and there isn't one remedy. There are many, right? So let's let's start by examining some of the explicit racist comments in this conversation. Phrases like, and I'm not going to say the entire thing because it's right there. You can read it. Phrases like, "I wouldn't with a," she's she's black and a little actress that no one has heard of are o overtly dehumanizing right these 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 comments reduce a a person's identity to their race it strips away any humanity and individuality. This kind of language is, is, is not only deeply offensive, but it also perpetuates this sort of harmful stereotypes that have no place in society. 
and I saw the interview that she 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 did in one of the morning shows, and she was just twisting her ankle and her, and her and everything to justify these these comments. And I I'll, I'll say I I don't think she. I don't think she regretted any of it, to be quite honest, allegedly, allegedly. So, we, we next, next we, we, we see this sort of subtler form of, of, of racism in, 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 in the conversation, such as not wanting other races and cultures to invade our own culture doesn't mean I hate their race just means I don't want their cultures in fate in mine. <laughs> this, this reflects a fear-based narrative that justifies exclusion and discrimination. It's important to recognize that systemic racism often hides behind such seemingly reasonable statements. And in the UK, they, they've, they've been experiencing this, I mean, at the height of all this, with, 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 with the whole thing, now they're sending asylum seekers to Rwanda, right? The, the, the conservative press, the information that they provide is, 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 is all misinformation. At one point they said, these asylum secrets were being put in five-star hotels. This, this sort of institutionalized racism, that it gets to, this, to that point where even when it's being sort of applied to you or you're being the, tar the target of it, it creates almost like a, 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 a space where you start to doubt yourself, where you're like, am I... It's just because when when everyone seems to be looking at this as 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 normal, and you're the only one thinking this is not right, you start to question your own self. This 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 kind of thinking reinforces barriers and 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 you know it really prevents genuine integration and understanding. It creates that you know them and us sort of mentality. When she makes statements like this this is Britain, not Africa, implies that being British is synonymous with being white. This notion is not only incorrect but also dangerous. Na nas sorry, national identity should be inclusive of 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 of, of all races and ethnicities, recognizing that diversity is what enriches a community. Having diverse opinions, having diverse experiences, right? I would argue that the strength of any society, the strength of any company, corporation, country, city, is the diversity that they have. And comments like that, er you know, erodes any sort of foundation that one may want to build. And then we see that sort of in intersectionality of gender and race. The, the, the intersection of race and gender is evident in comments like, <laughs> Like when she says she's a she's she's a gender equality explicit and she's obsessed with race. Look, women of color often face dual discrimination, being marginalized both as women and as people of color. This intersectionality must be acknowledged. Right? Because it's important to note that, I mean, stats came out where 
going to the hospital, whether it's in North America or whether it's in the UK, for a, a, a black woman, for a woman of color, it's more dangerous to go to a hospital because they don't take your pain seriously. And you have to be constantly advocating for yourself while they'll give the white person the medications that are appropriate or the painkillers or whatever they look at the black person and just say no you're just exaggerating or you're just a drug user then 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 they then they are the comments like and her seed will taint our royal family and just a dumb little commoner tiny brain these remarks are not only racist but also they they they're harmful stereotypes stereotyping is a powerful tool for maintaining prejudice views as it, 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 it completely reduces complex individuals to simplistic and often negative traits. We must challenge these stereotypes whenever we encounter them. It's a thing, like I said in the last, in, in, the, in the first part, when the former mayor of Toronto, right? made these, these, these awful comments about he's afraid that if he goes to Africa, they're going to put him in a pot and boil him. I mean, this, this, this was a mayor of one of the biggest major cities in North America, one of the most diverse cities in the world. You know, I... I I'm like, what, did he just watch a movie from like, I don't know, 1930s or something? Was he watching those, those, those black and white movies from like, um, ta ta uh, Tarzan? Or, 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 or reading some kind of antiquated racist comic or, or something? Because it, it, it doesn't occur to me that someone at that level could actually say something like that so what's the impact this this sort of thing has in society such conversations contribute to 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 a broader culture um uh cult um culture of of, of racism and exclusion when public figures or their associates make these kinds of statements it normalizes prejudice and it emboldens others to express similar views. This has a detrimental effect on societal co um, co cohesion and, and, and the well-being of those targeted by such racism. And we're seeing this all over the place now, right? All over the place. It's attitudes like these, and I'm just going to mention this briefly, that allows people to, to, to watch what's happening in Gaza, no Rafa, and, 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 and for some reason not care. Or for some reason equate that the life of a brown person or a person of color is worth less. The life of children who are not white are worth less. The life of babies that are not white are worth less. And I mean, these are reasonable, educated people who will I, I, just, just switch off any sense of humanity, empathy, or reasoning as long as it's happening to a certain population or that look a certain way. I mean, again, I don't want to make turn this in, in, into this sort of comparison, but 
how 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 did the world treat the Ukrainians when Russia started attacking the Ukraine? Right in Congo, in the in in in, in the democratic in, in in Congo, you know, that country holds a large reserve of I think it's um, um cobalt. And all of our mobile phones needs cobalt. A lot of our electronics, a lot of our ba a lot of and 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 it holds. I think I don't know seventy percent of the world's cobalt, and it's needed. And these big major corporations are in there, and some of the stuff that is happening and they're doing is just unthinkable. Unthinkable. To children, to an entire population of people, and this is where I get angry with our our leaders, right? But I'll say this, and then I'll move on from uh, on this part. L listen, I I from the from the day I turned eighteen, every single election there is for anything that is public or where I can vote, I get my behind and I vote. I get informed about who the candidates are, and I go and I vote. I know sometimes we may think it's not, ah, nah, that doesn't matter. It does matter. It does matter. Because the way I look at it, when I vote, I have a voice. And if I'm voting for you, and you've won, and you're doing some things that, and nah, 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 that it's not agreeable, or it's not the sort of platform that you sold me on. Oh, I'm I'm writing you letters. I'm calling your office, and I am giving you not peace of my mind because I need to keep all all of what I've got. But I will tell you exactly what I think, right? So I think that the media and public figures play a really crucial role in either perpetuating or challenging racist narratives. And we've seen consistently on UK media how these personalities, these journalists, it's it's quite insidious to, to, to watch um, certain shows, certain morning shows, and, and have a person, um, person of color who is relating an experience and then the other people question it. Or, or they say, you know, the whole thing with 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 with, with that that person, Danny, and 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 the quote unquote joke he was making with the chimpanzee. Oh, I didn't know Meghan Markle was half black. Oh, I, you 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 work in that industry, and you you don't know. Even if you didn't know, why do you think it's funny? Why? Because this whole narrative of the poor, the poor innocent white boy that didn't understand, I don't understand, nothing is happening. Right? They become these sort of like, oh, I don't know nothing. But then when they're ready, right, to inflict the pain and the harm and everything else, oh, they, they do know what they're doing. So, looking at this from a historical context also. It's important to understand that 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 racism in the UK um I don't well there there there, there there's a certain mentality that still exists right of that imperial attitude one of the people I was watching I I, I mentioned briefly you know, she wrote this 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 essay, and she was discussing about the monarchy and whether it will survive or not. And she was saying, you know, as long as at the pimps, at the pimps, I think it's called at the pumps. I I always get it get it wrong, um, but it's that event, and it's kept at the um, Albert Hall. And then towards the end, everyone starts to wave their flag, and they sing, "Oh, Britannia, Britannia!" And and she said. They still think they are an empire. 
there is still the legacy of that attitude and that mentality. And she goes, as long as you see them still singing with such, such vigor and, and, and that and that sense of, of, of we're better than the rest of you, we conquered you. She goes, the monarchy's gonna be fine. And let me be very clear here. I, I, these are her comments. These, 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 these are she, um, this person who wrote an essay um, and her interpretation, right? I don't have anything at all against one being proud of um, where you're from, proud of your nation, proud of your country, your city, your village, I think is fantastic. I think if they are um, traditional songs that one sings and all of that, I think it's great. My caveat to all of that is as we move on in our history, you know, some of the things that we did 200 years ago, we don't do them anymore because they're not acceptable. And, you know, if we used to call people a certain names or sing songs that denigrated uh, um, types of people or so on, we don't do that anymore, right? We, we, we adjust as, 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 as time goes on and, and we move along with, with um, the times. So I don't want this, this part to be misunderstood. Um, this is nothing on my behalf against people singing and, and, and being proud of, of being English and, and, and all of that. This is just me um, bringing in a commentary from um, this person who wrote an essay in regards to this and she she's on British and she was analyzing just the monarchy and um, um, people's attitude towards it and you know nationalism patriotism and all of that all right I think he enjoys these occasions is he enjoying his new job as king I fear not I mean he never liked going to Africa he was forced to go to Africa well, uh, shortly before he became king because he neglected the Commonwealth he liked going to the white Commonwealth countries he liked going a lot to India but he avoided Africa if he could. But he, Why? The, well, he just didn't find it culturally very interesting, whereas he was very interested in the culture of India. And the real truth is he doesn't, uh, Camilla doesn't like traveling long distances. I think he does find it very difficult now. Hey, Diane, let's start with you. Were you surprised by the revelations that came out in the interview yesterday? I wasn't completely surprised because it's been my view for some time that the treatment of Meghan by the media and also those anonymous Buckingham Palace briefers has been racist and unfair. But it was very moving to see her and hear her and realise that the pressure she was under almost broke her. Uh, when we talk about those higher institutions, I mean, Naomi, you were educated at Oxbridge. That's another one of our big, great British institutions. Was there anything that Megan mentioned during that interview that you could relate to? I think being one of very few black people at the institution, so I could empathise with that feeling of being different and trying to learn that environment and the rules of that environment and looking to people to help you to figure that out. I think what I, what I did have was a community of other black people to support me through that whilst I was there. And I think it was really sad to hear Megan speaking about reaching out for help and not being able to, to get that. And it wasn't surprising as such, but it, it was upsetting to hear that when she'd asked for it, she wasn't able to get that support. My question for us is, have you been in spaces or um, occasions where you were the only person of color, the only minority in that space? And how, how did it make you feel? And what kind of treatment did you receive? So for, for those who are willing to share um, just... Um, if we can 
use the comment section to um, answer that answer that question. I I have been in spaces where I was the only person of color or the only um, minority, um, and the, the one that I, I I think sort of stands out the most for me is my first year in university. I was in a class. Um, it was a literature class, it, 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 writing and development, basically. And I was the only person of color, the only minority, and everyone else was um, white. And our, one of our first assignments was to write a piece that had personal significance to you. It could be anything, but it should um, have some kind of significance to you. So I went to a high school that um, I was very fortunate because we had a very wonderful cross section of, of, of people from across the globe. And within that cross section, they were um, students who were refugees who had come from war torn um, places or their parents were refugees. Um, at one point. So I, uh, being curious and wanting to know about the human experience, um, for our uh, Remembrance Day, um, Veterans Day in the US, uh, one of my teachers had asked me to represent um, the Multicultural Club, um, which I was the president of at that, that year. So I thought, um, what I would do is what I would interview um, the refugee um, students that I knew and ask them about their experience. I wanted to know about their their stories and how war has affected them and in some ways bring in that Remembrance Day um, ceremony closer to home and 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 um, uh, talking about things that are happening or that was happening at that time. And they were very generous in, in giving me the time and I collected the stories and what I did was my portion, I just read the stories out on, on stage in the auditorium and, you know, to, to, to bring that, that, that emotion and human face to civilians um, and and how war affects them. So in university, this assignment, um, when I did that in high school, it sort of opened my eyes to another reality that I think I was never really paying any attention to, right? Because it wasn't affecting me directly. But now it was in my consciousness and it's in my consciousness and it's um, something that affected me personally. So I wanted to share those stories in that environment too. And I thought also, especially because this was a class of all white people and there was no other minority there except for myself. And, and for some reason I thought I wanted to make it uh, uh, my purpose to bring in other voices, uh, minority voices, in, in into that into that space and into that room. So as I was reading the stories, um, and these these were stories of of you know former um, um, students that I I went to school with, right? And I finished. I had four stories and because you were allotted so much time, and I was able to fit in four. As soon as I finished the fourth one, the next process was that the class would give you feedback and we were all seated in um, in a circle. And there was this, this, this guy, um, I, I would say across from where I was seated, um, seated uh, sort of like a football player, he's like six something, six, four, six, five, six, something really tall, big, um, um, very commanding, um, body type, right? He, he kind of got out of his seat, 
um, threw the chair to one side and walked towards me with fury in his eyes. And I was kind of like, I couldn't move. I, I was like, what, what's going on? Because it, it, it all happened very fast. And he crossed towards me and he came right into my face and started to yell. He said, how dare you? How dare you um, denigrate what my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, military servicemen who have fought for freedom for this country, who the F do you think you are? You are nothing. And he just continued to, I my face was covered with spit. I thought because he had his fist closed, I thought he is going to punch the living bejesus out of me. And at the same time, at the corner of my eyes, I'm looking at the teacher. She was um, she's a female, white female. And she just sat there. And when he was finished, he said, I don't know, if, no, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but, but, but it, was, it, was, it, was, it was threatening. Now, I'd never experienced anything like this in my life. And I thought, what just happened? So I'm looking at her now, so is most of the class, the professor, thinking, well, she's going to say something like, this is not acceptable. Like one can give a critique without physically threatening another student. And she basically said nothing. She looked at him and she said, well, I am glad you were able to articulate the way you felt. And that's very important. In this class, we have to be able to articulate the way our responses are going to be, and we have to be able to accept the critique. So I sat there thinking, oh, she just gave him a pass. She just excused what he just did. He just threatened me. He came up to my space, in my face, spat all over my face. But the words that she used completely now uh, covered him of any sort of, because what she basically said was that, you know, he was entitled to express his opinion the way he did. And I as a receiver of that critique, had to receive it the way it was delivered. I was just, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was lost, to be quite honest. And no one else in the class said anything. They, they just sort of moved on to the next person. And I will relate, I mean, this doesn't connect or makes any sense, but I'll tell you, the, the, the next, and because I remember it so well, the next person, she had written this piece that went something like this. Papam, papam, I was at the gas station. Papam, papam, there he was. Papam, papam, in his truck. Papam, papam. I went in, pa-pam, pa-pam. My clothes was off, pa-pam, pa-pam. And I don't need to continue to say what the rest was. And she was quite descriptive. And I thought, okay. And the professor was just like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And you're so insightful. And then the rest of the class started clapping and I'm thinking, am I in hell? Did I just die and went to hell? So it's, it's, 
it's that feeling of alienation of, of, of like being isolated it, it it is it is horrible but it's also even more so when you realize that no one is coming to number one your defense and that perhaps the systems that are there to protect you don't protect you so um paula did you feel a certain level of empathy with the sorts of detail that megan was given in that interview I completely empathised with the words that both Meghan and Harry used when they were being interviewed by Oprah. Um, I have lived the experiences that Meghan informed us about. I understand when she gave the description about internalising the pain that she was going through. Um, and we know when we heard those words that she isn't the only one. We know about the research that's been conducted into why it is that uh, black people in the British society represent so highly in our mental health system. We know about how that wearing down racism has on our mental health. So, so sadly, none of what she said came as a surprise to me. Um, Kike, in terms of the surprising revelations of which there have been quite a few that um, that we were able to witness yesterday, was there anything in particular that surprised you? For me, interestingly enough, it was the fact that Meghan felt that she was supported. Initially, she, she felt like they were on her side, only to realise that they weren't, that they weren't discrediting the newspapers, that they were having parties with them, yet, you know, Kate made her cry. And it came out that Meghan made her cry in the newspaper. No one came to her rescue. And I think for me, that's what surprised me that, um, you know, so many people can relate to that being in the workplace and thinking that maybe your manager is on your side, but really they're not. Um, and, and, and I think just seeing the fact that she was quite blindsided by the situation as well, that she didn't know what to expect. And Harry as well. They didn't, they didn't think that racism, you know, to that level existed, even though we do. And um, so that's why the interview wasn't, quite a surprise for me, but I think I was just really touched by the fact that they didn't know that that was what was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I know there are more black women within parliament now than when you first started, Diane. Was it lonely? Oh, it was lonely. And I still get excited to go into parliament and see a whole bunch of young black women there. It's amazing to me after 33 years. But it was lonely and it was isolating. And when things went wrong, you kind of blamed yourself. You thought, this must be me. And of course, everyone around you um, didn't discourage you from blaming yourself. So it was isolating. Nearly 30 years of isolation. And, you know, when you would talk about that and when you try to be open about it, we then faced with people said, well, it's got nothing to do with the race. It's got nothing to do with the race. It must be something else. Well, first of all, I didn't talk about it for years and years. It was my staffers, young black women who said to me, Diane, you know, this is terrible. You have to speak out. So I did speak out a couple of years ago. But it's extraordinary to me just how so many commentators and so many newspapers refused to accept that the way Meghan was treated had to be, had to do with her being a mixed race woman, that they don't want to accept that some of the discrimination and the microaggressions that black women in politics face is to do with being black women. And, and Paula, I see you nodding away there. I'm, I'm assuming within law, <laughs> uh, it's not been easy for you either. It, it, it um, has been horrific. The abuse that I have suffered and up until we went into lockdown was suffering. Um, at, at one point I lost my voice, which is a good thing for a barrister. But I was so distressed and the message was so clear to me, you do not complain. You do not complain, you do not make a fuss. You will lose work, you will get paid less, you won't get the best jobs and you will accept that as an outcome. And you will wear your hair in a particular way, you won't wear your hair naturally, you will dress in a particular way. 
And so these were the messages that were consistently said to me. And, you know, when Megan spoke about that that pressure and I have spoken about having to wear an armour and when we've just heard from Diane just now about feeling lonely you are completely isolated and you do not even have an opportunity to voice because if you do you are shut down you are angry you are aggressive you are playing the victim you've completely blown it out of proportion you're so oversensitive and so even in making the complaints and raising my grievance now, because it's after 20 odd years of practicing that I have felt brave enough to say something, that I am still having to identify particular examples where there are other people around, because the other people will validate what happened to me. It, it, it can't just come from me. Yeah. I mean, what sort of circumstances are we, are we talking here, Paula? Because I've read articles with you before, with you spoken about the fact that you walk into a room full of white barristers and someone will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, you've come into the wrong room. Yes. And I know I'm smiling, but, but this is my armour. This is what I do. I have to smile. I have to shrug. I'm at work and I have a client who is sitting outside. So when I walk into the advocate's room, or I walk into a room where the other barristers are and I engage in a conversation relevant to the case and someone, a white person, turns to me in a room full of white people and says, sorry, who, who are you? Why are you here? This is just for the barristers. And everyone else goes absolutely puce and nobody says anything and I point out who I am and the person who says that to me, who asked me to leave, doesn't apologise, doesn't, you know, will turn their back on me and will not engage with me. And this barrister will then go outside and represent a person of colour. You know, it was time that I said something. Yeah. Um, Naomi, when it came to you going to university and being the only one uh, of, a, of a darker skin colour within that environment, was there part of you that thought at any point, I just don't know if I have the strength to do this? When I arrived in my college, I was the only person in my year group of a black background and it was just such a culture shock and I wasn't sure if I'd manage it, not because I didn't think I could do the work, but I wasn't used to being the only person like me. And what I did is I sought out people within the African and Caribbean society and I formed a support network there so that I had people to go and talk to who sort of understood my cultural references and also could provide support when things did happen that maybe made me feel less included. Than, than when I was back at home. And I think working with all the Target Oxford students now, what we really try and do is show them that there are other black people at Oxford and Cambridge now, and it has changed, but also to have those frank conversations about what you might encounter and how to handle that. But the challenges start earlier, unfortunately. So it's not uncommon for us to have students be told by their teachers, we're not quite sure that Oxbridge is for you. And so we do quite a lot of work helping them to advocate for themselves early on to get the right predicted grades, get to go to the right events so that they can pursue their dream. And you know, the, you know going to Oxford or Cambridge is like the bastion of education when it comes to, to, to university, especially within this country. And yet there is still a lack of education when it comes to looking at what it is that they are teaching their students, the, the, the syllabus, the writers, the, the type of, uh, of learned men and women that they choose to focus on, that also makes a difference, doesn't it? It does, it does. And there's been, as the number of people from different backgrounds has increased at Oxford and Cambridge, there's been more calls for, okay, we're in now, but what happens when we're here? What are we being taught? Who are we being taught by? And is that sufficiently inclusive and representative to ensure that we're seeing things from different angles? And so there are new groups being set up to really interrogate curriculum. And it's not about taking things off. I think that's the thing people get very exercised about. And it's not about that. It's about broadening things out and looking at things from multiple perspectives and having voices of people from underrepresented groups. Because if you want to understand a subject, you have to look at it from all perspectives and it can't be just one set of voices. Of course, so many people fight fight against that, but it's interesting what you talk about when you mention so much like strength in numbers, which is hugely important, isn't it, Kike? Yeah, um, that is why I started BYP Network. It was all about 
connecting black professionals in the UK and around the world so that we can come together and basically solve our own problems, but also admit to what we see in terms of racism and then build our own privileges in order to com combat that. So for example, you know, we work with a lot of um, corporations, um, but we work with their senior leaders as well, their black senior leaders, to speak to the community, to tell us how did you get to where you are? What defenses do, did you um, have? What mechanisms can we use? Um, who can I contact within that company that can refer me to the company? You know, who can fend for me? Who can sponsor me? Um, you know, and a big part of that is allies, you know, and I'm a big believer of those who understand racism exists. They may not look like us, but they know. It's those people defending Megan who aren't black, but they know that it does exist. But there's a whole subset of the UK community that just don't want to know, that don't want to believe it, that don't care. And for me personally, I don't work on those people, you know, because I'm like, maybe their time will come when they do change, but there are people that are in powerful positions that can help us. And I think us coming together, just like right now, just like with Meghan Markle is important. Um, and the global community as well, they're seeing what the UK is doing. They're seeing what it's about and it's having a negative impact on the monarchy for sure. Um, and also the reputation of the UK. Did anything of what the ladies were saying um, sounds familiar to you or resonates with you? Because I'll tell you, a lot of what they've said has resonated with me. Um, and the, 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 the assumptions that are made about, about any of us, people of color, minorities, and the thing that, for example, that Paula was saying is there is no apology after you've either explained yourself or you're, you, you know, it's, 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 it's this, this brazen sort of attitude that I, I'm entitled to talk to you like that or question you. And I've had similar stuff where I've, walked into a meeting um, and I'm, I'm carrying, you know, a, a cappuccino or something that I just made and someone will, as I walk in, they'll say, oh, can, can you get me one, one of the, of, of those, please? Uh, oh, you know, they go, um, I'll, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll have my coffee with the blah, blah, blah. And then someone else, I'll have my, this, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, um, I am not here to serve your coffee or to make your coffee. So you can go get your own coffee, right? But they assume that I'm there to take coffee orders. But not, it's, it's, it's not even that there was a question. There wasn't an ask. There wasn't, oh, hi, are you, are you, I see you have a, a, a coffee there, a cappuccino. Are you... Do you make coffee for, 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 for the people in the meeting or, or, but, but, the, but, the, but the thing is like, why, 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 why even make that assumption? Why, why, what, what gives you the, the right, you know, and it does, and it's interesting to me, this conversation, because Sometimes we think that this stuff is happening at a certain level or even a certain level of your career. And I'll tell you, it's, it's happening at every single level and people that you think would be able to sort of defend themselves become voiceless, like as Paula was, was um, saying. And I'm not going to get into details of, of my situation presently, but until, you know, until my last, my last set of um, whatever comes in from the company. But it, it, the last while, it's been just horrendous. And the gaslighting and, and the treatment is... You, 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 you left thinking, but I came to work for this company because you stood for all these things. And are you telling me now it's all a lie? It's all just for show? The other thing that has left me really stupefied is that 
no one comes to your rescue. Even people who you called your your work family or your um, you know you 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 share things with and you get personal with and you've known them for many years. You know you've gone over to each other's places and and you you've you you're planning holidays together and when things start to happen and you go and you say listen you know that these things are not true would you back me on it and the answer is sorry i don't want to get involved and you're looking going what what do you mean like this is this is wrong you know it's wrong so you and it's 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 it shocked me. It shocked me how people just did not, did not come to my defense. None of them. And even the groups that I was in, these are groups, um, employee groups, um, people just sort of treated you as if you had leprosy or something. Because at the, I realized that at the end of the day, money was more important than anything else. And I don't, I don't, you know, judge anyone. Like, look, everyone needs to make a living and needs to think about themselves, their families, and so on, right? And if their job or position or career is going to be in jeopardy to do what? To defend or to back a, 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 a colleague, right? Against, you know, people who have power. So I thought this conversation w was, was important because I don't think many times, I mean, I don't know, but, but do, we, do, we, do we disclose these things? Do we sit down in 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 community and and talk about it, and try and 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 find actionable things to do and really have each other's back, right? Because you know, as as Paula was 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 saying, the um lawyer, the barrister, it's you know it's amazing that she's a barrister and having to deal with this kind of stuff. Anyone having to deal with this kind of stuff, right? Walking into spaces and people looking at you like, why, why are you here? You don't belong here, right? I mean, I've, I've, I walked into a store once and the person just said, well, not once, it's happened to me more, more, more than once, where they literally just, just follow me. And I'm thinking, why are you following me? I don't, I, I don't need your help presently. And I usually, if I go into a store, it's because there's something I'm looking for and I want to buy. And as much as I think we move forward, the daily experiences of many of us um, tells us that these prevailing ideas and stereotypes and you know, discrimination and all of that is still alive and well. Very much so, alive and well. And when we have politicians and, and newscasters and journalists just not doing their job, but creating more and more separation and, and isolation and, you know, creating these tribes that, that we're supposed to go and fit ourselves into and it's a sad, sad, sad situation. And I, I really appreciate how they brought it back to what Megan was feeling and how she was being treated. And for them to confirm and reaffirm that, you know, she isn't crazy because we know she's not, right? Um, what I also find very fascinating is, is, is how much um, there isn't a true 
recognition that this happens enormously in the UK. I mean, Diane Abbott, a couple of months ago, and I don't want to get into it because I don't I know, know the um, specifics, but, you know, James O'Brien was saying like she's owed an apology, but he said she's not going to get it because she's just, she's just another black woman, right? Like, why even bother? The dehumanization, it's just a disrespect. Well, it, it got kind of heavy, didn't it? I can feel it now. I can feel it right now. Because also, I'm, I'm starting to bring in experiences and, 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 and remembering them, right? All right. So, let's end it here. Thank you so much. I hope this was of value. And I know sometimes these topics are difficult. And at the same time that, you know, we've, we've had enough of it. We've heard enough of it. We know enough of it. But I also think it is useful sometimes to remind ourselves and to hear perspectives of what others are going through and how they might be handling it. So... I hope in all of this, um, you got something useful, okay? Take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, and um, until we speak again. Take a death and wait, stay light as a feather, a feather. Shake away the weight, cup what makes you tether, tether. Trust when you fall in every risk you take Knowing redemption's always on its way Let all the courage in you start to wake Unafraid, unafraid As a treasure, treasure. Trust when you fall in every risk you take. Knowing redemption's always on its way. Let all the courage in you start to wake.